Welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Today we are joined by Alan Silvestri with Growth Gorilla, and we're talking all about links. Link building is such a fun topic that we get to get into sometimes on the podcast, and today is a link building day. So I love Alan's approach to this entire topic. We spend the first probably two thirds of the conversation talking about a very in depth look at how to approach link building, and it's not a Uh, spray and pray method at all. It's a very in-depth analysis that he and his team go through whenever they're looking to build links and to really amplify content. We start with a term he calls the content graveyard and he goes into explaining uh, about how much missed opportunity there is with a lot of content on websites that just never sees the light of day. It never really ranks. And then he gets into the process they go through to analyze the type of links that need to be built uh, how many links that need to get built, et cetera, et cetera. We spend the last part of the interview where I just hit him with question after question after question, getting into the really finer points of link building, um, velocity that you build links at, anchor text and anal- analyzing the anchor text you need, do follow, no follow, domain level versus backlink level, how important relevancy is for a link versus the power that comes from a link, um, how you pick your targets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can tell it, it's not short on depth when, when, we, when we're talking about links here today. I think you're gonna enjoy a lot of what Alan has to say. If you're new to link building, he outlines the process really really, really well from a strategic point. And if you've been link building for a long time, I think there's a lot to gain here for you from the depth he goes into with a lot of the examples. So enjoy. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. We got tiny links and placements on massive websites such as The Express, Mirror, Daily Record and many more with a campaign about the pros and cons of popular diets. Mm. How about? This is exactly how we've done it. Our client is a very popular fitness client. We have asked them to provide thorough expert commentary about the pros and cons of the most popular diets. Once we have this information, we put this in a nice email and send it out to 15,000, yes, 15,000 journalists from around the world that write about fitness. So good. And all healthy. Big publications picked up our story from the email, giving our client massive, juicy, saucy, healthy links that are 100% relevant to their website and that will keep the rankings of the website in a great shape. You see what I've done there? I hope this case study inspires and that you will start leveraging expert commentary type campaigns to land links to your or your client's website just like we've done it with this campaign. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search intelligence dot co dot uk and get in touch with them now all right and welcome back to the niche pursuits podcast my name is jared bauman and today i am joined by alan, alan silvestri with uh, growth gorilla alan welcome on board hey jared thanks for having me i've been a long long time listener uh, to the podcast since like 2013 since i first started like my journey in SEO and affiliate websites. So I'm really stoked uh, to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And like I, I always say, if I, it's so great when we have a, a long time listener that comes on the podcast. Um, I was the uh, I was the same. I started listening probably around the same time as, as you and um, it, it serendipitously ended up hosting the podcast many, many years later, <laughs> but grew up on the back of learning SEO from from this podcast as well. So it's good to have a success story. I suppose we can We'll claim a little yeah. bit of a success story out of it. <laughs> Definitely, um, for sure. So you've been doing, you just said SEO, or at least learning and, and doing it since about 2013. Tell us and fill us in on, I mean, that's a decade now. Fill us in on kind of how you got started and, and kind of bring us up to speed on your background. Mm-hmm. So straight out of school, I've been working nine years in an office job doing something that's like totally different from SEO. I was playing in a band at the time uh, with a couple of friends. And so the main problems we had was that every time we needed like days off to go uh, play with the band, we needed to ask permission for the office job to like get the days off, right? 
So essentially I started looking for something online to be able to make some extra cash initially and to have the freedom to be able to play with the band. So I did the classic search how to make money online, <laughs> right? Okay. And so I guess so I guess that's how I came across affiliate websites. That was my first adventure into the the online kind of making money uh, world. And so affiliate website is how I've discovered SEO, search engine optimization. I started uh, I started a couple of affiliate websites on the side while still working the office job, uh, so part-time essentially every night. And then I got hired by this guy that was running uh, the first online course that I officially bought. Uh, the guy noticed me on a couple of Facebook groups. He saw that I was taking action and I was getting results from my from my websites. And so he decided to hire me kind of like an apprentice. Um, so that's been really helpful and really formative for me to really nail down the basics of SEO. And that's also how I stumbled upon a link building, which is it's basically 100% of what we do now. Uh, the reason for that is because the site that I started working with for this guy had a ton of uh, content that was already published on the site. The main problem with the content, uh, quality was great. The main problem is that some of it wasn't ranking just because there was so much of it. And so it was really difficult at a certain point uh, to get the content to rank. So what we needed was essentially more and higher quality backlinks. The guy uh, put me in charge of the whole link building operation. And so this is how I ended up defining uh, what is still currently kind of uh, like my unique process and approach uh, for doing link building outreach and to rank uh, pages for specific keywords. Um, so then around 2017, 2018, this is when I started Growth Gorilla. Initially, it was just me and a, a VA and I was still doing most of the work. And then over time, I was able to delegate some of the more repetitive parts of the process. And now we are 10 people. We have a link prospecting team and an outreach management team, and we work with anywhere between like 10, 15 clients, mostly in the B2B SaaS space. So that's um, that's definitely saying something. When you take an SEO course and the person who puts on the course hires you to work on his website or websites, um, mm -hmm. what were the like? What were the types of things that you were building at at that time? You know, you, you mentioned that he took notice of of the results mm -hmm. you were getting, like. And that was a time period where affiliate marketing was very different than it is now. What were you like? What are, what are some of the things you're working on? Yeah, so mainly, I guess the thing that he noticed about me was that I was following the steps that he laid out in the course, and I was actually making progress. So anything I was doing, I was posting on the Facebook group to show that I was taking action. Uh, you know, because some people they just buy a course and then they maybe complete like twenty percent of it and then they just stop doing it and they say that it doesn't work. But in reality, it's just that they didn't take the action that was necessary. Uh, so with me, I've always been a doer. So if I say that I do something that I actually do my best to always take action and complete that thing. Uh, so I guess this is the main thing. Just the fact that I was taking massive action and I was actually getting results because my site started making money. Uh, the main thing that I did well with that site is I was able to pick a good niche that wasn't very competitive. I think the site was, if I remember correctly, in the hair removal space, so epilators, uh, like all that stuff. <laughs> and so I did a good job at picking the right niche with not a, a lot of competition. And also, I think I did a good job in the link building stuff because that's what I kind of started liking and becoming more passionate about uh, straight from the very beginning. Yeah, I have to say I have a, a little course that I launched last year for to help people with, with taking better pictures for their website. And you get the stats, you know, I don't look very often, but I have been in the back and you can see everyone who signed up and how far they've completed it. And I have to admit you are right. Not many people as a percentage go through it. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones who tend to go get through 20, 30% tend to get through the whole thing, it seems, you know, by and large. But, mm -hmm. but you're right, not as many people end up getting through the course. So that is, yeah. uh, that's an interesting find. Um, well, let's talk about, um, about, you know, maybe I want to transition us to talking about content and how you and your team work on content amplification. I mean, I'll say that from a high level, obviously we talk about content quite a bit here on this podcast. Maybe let's start by setting the stage for 
outline this this process as you see it for for getting content mm-hmm. to rank, um, and yeah. then maybe we can start to kind of deep dive into the details of it. How, how does that sound? Yeah, sounds great. Um, so the main concept where we can get started from is what I call the content graveyard. This is something that I came up with to identify all of that content that's essentially sitting from page two and lower, and it's not really doing anything for the businesses, right? So uh, something that I really like to um, uh, to use to explain this is if you look at uh, your content production efforts, they typically look like a linear staircase, right? So you publish two articles one month, two articles the next month, so it keeps going the same way, basically until you keep this publishing schedule. The difference between this and content promotion, which for us is mainly done uh, through link building, is that content promotion and link building looks more like an exponential scale. So it starts off super, super slow, and then over time, if you do things right, then it typically compounds. So what a lot of people don't understand is that it it requires patience. So, So what they do is Maybe they get to a certain point in the beginning where it's going super slow, they're not getting much results. So they get discouraged. And so what they do is they simply quit and they say links don't work. Uh, This is not working for me. And so what they typically would do is just keep publishing and pumping out content in the hope they will magically rank. So what happened then is all of this content sits essentially page two, page three, page five, page 10, and does nothing for the business. So this is is basically what we call the content graveyard. Basically a bunch of content that's just sitting there that's not being proactively promoted uh, with link building or with whatever it is that you want to do to promote it. And it's, uh, yeah, basically not doing much for the business. So it's very important, I think, for companies to take a proactive approach and be willing to say, uh, we've invested this amount in the content production. So we need to also invest this amount into actually promoting this content to get it to rank because that's uh, the whole purpose of a content strategy. Let me ask you a question on that. I'd love to get your opinion on it. Uh, A lot of people in SEO kind of say, you know, live by the mantra like, hey, I know that only 20% ish, 25%, whatever number it is, I know a small amount of the content that I publish will actually end up getting on page one normally, but that's okay because that drives the majority of my traffic. Are you saying that actually the goal of a website should be to get the majority of your content to rank on page one and not let anything end up in the graveyard? So it it really depends on how, how much content you're actually publishing. In some situations, it might not be possible uh, to get all the content to rank because you don't have enough resources, you don't have enough time to actually build backlinks or promote all the content that you're doing. But in most situations, what we see is we get started with a client, for example, where they have 50% of their traffic producing pages that are just sitting page two and lower. Mm -hmm. And then typically after like between six to 12 months, we're able to increase that percentage uh, for the pages that are ranking higher than that to be able to get to a distribution that looks more like 20% of the content is sitting in page two and lower and the rest is basically uh, higher than that. So so anything that you can do to be able to decrease the content graveyard percentage, essentially that's still gonna be good for your business and it's gonna be best uh, better than just leaving the content sit there essentially. Well, I have a lot of other questions on that front for you, but I, I, I'll save them for as we kind of drill into the details. Um, let me let me keep let me not interrupt you. Let me let you keep going. Obviously, this is a problem that a lot of websites are going to have, and probably anybody listening right now who has a website can probably pull up their analytics and see a lot of their pages they publish content for mm-hmm. that um, you know they're either not getting traffic or they're getting such a minimal amount of traffic. So I'll let you keep going in terms of you know how you approach handling that issue. But I'm glad we're talking about it because it's a it's an issue that probably almost every site owner has. Yeah. So the first thing that I would recommend people do with a website is you could take two competitors and let's say that the first one is a realistically beatable competitor and the second one is more of a North Star competitor, right? Uh, What you can do then is you can have a look at the backlink data to really see the difference in percentages of the backlinks that are pointing to the homepage compared to the backlinks that are pointing to internal pages. So when you see these charts across the three websites, so your site and the two competitors, then you can really 
kind of understand whether the other two guys are being more aggressive and more proactive with their content promotion. Because if they have more of their backlink profile that's pointing to internal pages, that typically means that they're being more proactive and they're just going after backlinks to internal pages, which for us internal pages is anything that's not the home page. So this could be blog articles, it could be feature pages for a software company, it could be some some other kind of landing pages that you have on the site, right? So that's the first step. Uh, checking to make sure whether the main problem why you're not ranking, is it because the other guys are being more proactive or is it because maybe your domain rating is just lower so you, so you need to increase the strength of your website in terms of backlinks? Um, so uh, if the reason why you're not ranking is instead because your domain rating is uh, lower than the other guy. Uh, this is the strength of your backlinks, uh, the strength of your site in terms of a backlink profile, right? So this could be domain rating, domain authority, if you're using Ahrefs or Moz. Uh, if that's the reason why you figure out that you're not ranking, then the best thing that you can do is to build more backlinks to the home page. So it's kind of like the opposite. So it's one or the other. You can do both if you have enough resources. So build backlinks to internal pages while at the same time also build links to the home page to increase the domain rating uh, but yeah these are typically the two things that we like to get started with this assessment to know whether we need to be more proactive with internal pages or with the whole authority of the site so i've heard the argument said that when you build links to internal pages it raises your domain's authority about the same as if you build them to your home page but you obviously get more uh, focused power from that link when you build it to an internal page. Now, I know the mm -hmm. devil's advocate, I know the opposite argument, but talk through in maybe a little bit more detail how someone picks between building links to their home page versus to a specific inner page, because I think that's probably an often confused decision mm -hmm. inflection point for people. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, it all comes down to what, uh, to what you see ranking in the SERPs, right? So if you want to rank your target page, which might be a blog article for a target keyword, and then you uh, you have a look at the top 10 ranking results for that keyword. Uh, let's say that you see all sites that have a higher domain rating. Then in that case, the first step for me would be to build backlinks to the homepage, just because that's uh, <clears throat> for me the fastest way to increase the overall domain rating of the site. Sure, you can increase domain rating by building links to internal pages, but it's gonna take uh, longer and that but that also depends on how you're doing uh, uh, internal linking, right? Because that's very important to be able to distribute the link juice. Um, so if I see that all of the sites ranking have a higher domain rating than me, then I would probably focus straight away on building more backlinks to the homepage. Uh, vice versa, if I see that, that there are some weaker sites that are ranking, then I might just focus on the specific, uh, specific URL. Um, the other thing that's very important to mention is it all depends on your goals. So if you have business goals, you want to rank specific pages because they can bring in revenue, signups, sales, whatever, then uh, that's probably a, a good, uh, like a good enough reason to focus on internal pages because you will get faster ROI just by ranking those specific pages. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, it's obviously page specific too. Um, all right, so any other things that keep content in the graveyard, as it were? I mean, I, you talked about links um, and DR as an overall mm -hmm. domain metric, but any other things before we kind of move on from that? Yeah, so uh, we, uh, so, I, so I always like to reference a study that was done by Ahrefs. They essentially analyzed all of the, like a lot of ranking pages, and they figured out how 91% of the content that get published doesn't get traffic from Google. The number one reason that they found that was like a correlation with that is because that content didn't have backlinks. And so this is kind of like what we just discussed. The other two reasons why they figured out that the content wasn't getting traffic is uh, uh, the second one is because the content wasn't targeting keywords with search traffic potential. So this could be a classic example uh, that we see a lot with software companies where all they publish in their blog is maybe product updates like they're like uh, <laughs> we just uh, we just added this feature or come join us on our next conference you know so all these things that don't really like need to rank for anything there's a lot of people 
that think that this is having a content strategy. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's really not <laughs> what we believe. So targeting keywords with search traffic potential that also have business potential for you. That's the second mistake that people uh, typically do. And the third thing is that the content wasn't matching the search intent or the content type with the top 10 ranking results. So search intent is essentially you need to make sure that your page is matching what the users want to find in Google. The, the easiest way to figure that out is to look at the top 10 pages that are already ranking because chances are Google is already showing you what it wants to rank. Sometimes you might get away with creating something that's different and completing a, 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 a polarizing maybe uh, <coughs> compared to what's ranking. But for the most part, we've seen good results if you try to stick with what's already out there in terms of search intent, but also in terms of content type. So if you want to rank for this keyword and you see that the top 10 ranking results are uh, basically are blog articles, then chances are you might want to do a blog article as well for that keyword instead of, uh, say, a landing page. Um, so these three things are the main factors that I think keep the content in the graveyard. So the fact of not having a <coughs> backlink or not having the right backlink. The same. The second thing is to target the wrong keywords or keywords that don't have search traffic potential. And the third thing is to target the wrong search intent or the wrong content type for the specific keyword that you want to rank. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I know that there's going to be people out there thinking this right now. As a matter of fact, they're probably commenting uh, <laughs> on the YouTube page. So what about content quality keeping articles in the graveyard? Is there um, obviously links play a role? Quality of content at some point has to play a role, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe can you touch on that to, to talk to people mm -hmm. about the quality of the content playing a role as well? Yeah, content quality for me. Um, so yeah, also like search intent and content type, they kind of um, like make part of what we define as content quality as well. So to have a good quality article uh, that you want to rank for this keyword, you really need to make sure that it's matching the search intent uh, <coughs> with the content type as well. So that's the main thing. Second thing is we've seen something happening with a lot of clients where we noticed that the content quality wasn't enough to be able to rank the content higher. And so they really needed more backlinks at that point. Uh, we call this the content quality threshold, essentially, when you've done essentially everything that you could to optimize this page for its target keyword. So you can use software like ClearScope or Surfer SEO to optimize the page. You can optimize your internal linking structure and all of that kind of like the on-page stuff, essentially. Once you know that the on-page stuff has been done like 90%, 100% of what you could do, uh, <clears throat> then typically if you don't see any more movement, the reason is because you need extra backlinks. So yeah, content quality really plays a part in this. But at some point, especially for the more competitive keywords, you will probably hit this content quality threshold where the only thing that you need is more or higher quality backlinks. So what we do is for every client, when we get started, we do this content promotion roadmap. We pick the target pages that we want to work on every single month. Uh, but before we uh, we actually go ahead and start building backlinks, we want to make sure that the content has been fully optimized and the content quality is the best that the client possibly can have, right? So uh, yeah, it's definitely important to make sure that content quality is top notch before you even, st uh, <coughs> you even start building uh, backlinks to the page. Yeah, it is really, uh, it's a good It's a good point that you're making. I kind of want to double down on it for everyone listening, right? That, um, you know, this is a spectrum and ranking for keywords is a spectrum. And there's keywords that are very low in competition and that don't take as much power from your domain. They don't take as many links to rank for, but they might not take any links to rank for. And then there's queries that are really competitive and that mm -hmm. a lot of uh, other websites have published content on and these queries need to have better content usually to rank they need to have optimized content to rank and then also very oftentimes they either need a strong domain or a lot of links or both and so i think that the spectrum to make sure everyone kind of grasps like there's a there's there's targeting low competition keywords and and these are based in many ways on the idea that you don't need a strong domain and or a lot of backlinks mm -hmm. and then there's targeting keywords that have a lot of 
authority behind them. And, and that's a little bit of a different process. And really, I think that's where you're doubling down and what we're really getting into today is how to win with, we'll say, maybe competitive keywords. Yeah. Yeah. The reason for that is because for the most part, we want to work with clients that have a content strategy where the main goal is for that content to bring in signups and revenue. So typically, the majority of this content is going to be targeting competitive keywords uh, because chances are uh, sales oriented keywords. So the middle or the bottom of the funnel, those will typically be more competitive as well. So yeah, this is, is usually what we have to uh, face for the majority of our clients. Ah, okay, good. So you, you tease this content promotion roadmap. Can you go into like more detail on what that includes and, and what, you know, what you guys map out? Uh, yeah, so the content promotion roadmap is a process that we do every quarter, essentially, for our clients. The reason for that is because, uh, yes, we plan for the long term, right? So if you remember the content graveyard um, kind of explanation that I gave before, we really want to plan for the long term. That said, we like to focus on quarterly sprints because ch uh, things change so fast, especially in, in SEO, especially right now with all the updates that Google is doing that it doesn't really make sense for us to plan out the pages that we're going to be working on for the next 12 months. So what we typically do is we just plan the pages that we're going to be focusing on for the next three months. And then every quarter we redo this roadmap uh, to be able to plan the next sprint, essentially. This also gives us a good indication of whether we're making progress or not. At the end of the quarter, we can assess the results. We can see whether some pages have moved up into the rankings and so this allow us to uh, to be able to uh, give more direction to the client as well. So the roadmap is a three step framework, let's say. We start off by identifying what we call the keyword difficulty baseline. Uh, what the keyword difficulty baseline is, <coughs> essentially is a customized keyword difficulty uh, range that we identify for the specific client's website for the situation as it is right now. So most people simply use the keyword difficulty that's provided by some SEO tools, but that is just a standardized keyword difficulty that identifies the difficulty in ranking for each keyword, right? So instead, what we want to do with this is to assign keyword difficulty buckets that are specific to the client site. So we have this whole process that can tell us which keywords uh, we can realistically expect that the client site is currently capable of ranking higher for in the short term. So to be able to do this, we can have a look at the, uh, basically all the keywords that the client is already ranking for in positions one to three. And so this gives us a chart that can tell us, okay, for example, the client can rank super well for keywords that have a difficulty of between five and 15, for example, or they can rank quite well for keywords that have a difficulty between 20 and 40 and the rest is very difficult. So we do this every quarter as well as part of the roadmap. So that, so this helps us, uh, this is really helpful to, uh, to prioritize the target pages that we're going to be scheduling in for the quarter. So once we've done this, step two is to get what we call the quick win keywords. These are all the keywords and pages that are ranking, as we said before, between position four and position 10 or 15. So the bottom of page one and the top of page two, we know that these keywords and pages are uh, like already ranking quite well. So chances are with maybe a couple of extra backlinks, some extra uh, kind of optimization, they might be able to shoot up into the top five or the top three. So once we got this quick win keywords, and then we pair them up with the keyword difficulty buckets that we identified before. So we know maybe we have 50 keywords uh, basically on the list. Uh, 10, 15, 20 of those might be within the easy keyword difficulty bucket that we identified. So we're going to prioritize those first. Then uh, once we have all of these keywords and we have uh, assigned the keyword difficulty bucket as well, the next step, and this is very important, is we ask some input from the client to be able to know which pages uh, actually have some business potential because we don't want to just shoot in the dark and promote or build backlinks to whatever page that we have in the list. We actually want to build backlinks to pages that have some business potential so that uh, the client is going to have a higher kind of ROI, essentially. So the clients give us their like sales conversion data so we can uh, map that out 
to the list that we have at this point. And the last step of the roadmap is once we have this um, short list with client input, we have all the queue difficulty data, we know that these pages are already ranking quite well. The last step is to do what we call a deep dive analysis. So we really want to make sure here that those pages are matching what we mentioned before. So content type, search intent and content quality. So we do a whole analysis, we have a look at the top 10 ranking results, see what really is the search intent behind the target keyword. Step two is content type, really making sure that it's matching the content type. And the last thing is we run the page through a tool like ClearScope or Surfer SEO, as I mentioned before, to make sure that the content is really well optimized. Because at the end of the day, the backlinks that we build later uh, will be more effective if the content is really optimized, uh, basically as best that the client can, right? So this is it, essentially. Uh, once we're done with this last analysis, we schedule the pages uh, in for the quarter, and then we're going to get started with the uh, <coughs> the rest of the process, essentially. Whew, that's a lot of work, especially to do every quarter. <laughs> you rip that up every quarter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's quite a lot of work, but we got a, a quite a, a systemized process. That, that's the main thing. Once you can systemize the parts that are repetitive, and then everything becomes sort of easier. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. High tier backlinks in publications such as Daily Post, MSN, Birmingham Mail, and many more. Let me show you how we've done it. The campaign was pretty simple. We looked at the number of Instagram followers for each contestant in the Dancing on Ice show that aired in January. We sorted the contestants by the most popular ones. Now we've had the most influential Dancing on Ice contestant. Then we've also used an Instagram earnings calculator to calculate how much every contestant could make from one post on Instagram based on the number of their followers and engagement rate. Then we put these findings in a nice press release and an email and we found the relevant journalists with a tool called Roxhill where we looked at journalists who covered the show in the past 30 days and sent the findings and the press release to these journalists. And then the links started landing like this and this and this and many more. I hope this inspires and shows you that you can build links with simple and basic campaigns. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. So let me ask you a question before we move on to the next part. Um, like, uh, and I, I struggle with this sometimes with uh, like a website I have. How much of a role does the fluctuations that come with, say, Google updates, algorithm updates, how much does that play in something like this? Um, and I guess, you know, obviously there, there, there's, there's a time where a, a Google update comes out and a website can get really, really affected by it, you know, like maybe lose traffic by like mm -hmm. 50%. I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm just talking about like, you know, the, 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 the ups and the downs that come with 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 ranking changes, but maybe as a result of an actual algorithm update, does that play a role in what you guys choose to focus on? Like, um, uh, if something just shot up from a Google update, mm -hmm. uh, will that play a more significant role in choosing it? Um, do you factor any of these things in, or is it just kind of wherever it's ranking at that time and the competitors it's up against at that time the analysis is done and you just go forward with it? Mm. Yeah, we really just try to focus on best practices, you know, all the time. So at the end of the day, I think it doesn't really make sense to focus too much on Google updates because otherwise you will always be chasing one thing after the other. Uh, as long as you focus on the main best practices, try to do a good quality job, that's like a, a, a holistic approach, uh, then I think you'll be fine and you don't really need to be worried about the micro, focus more about the macro. That's what I would say, yeah. I was kind of hoping you'd say that because it sounds complicated enough to <laughs> <laughs> execute all this, especially at scale, and then to try to factor in you know some of these things that are really out of your control. But yeah. um, had to ask, had to ask. So okay, um, that was a really detailed process that, that you walked through. What does that look like in terms of um, you know in terms of some of the nuts and bolts with analyzing the a specific keyword? Um, how do you determine? Mm -hmm you know, if it needs more links, um, you talked a bit about how to determine if the content needs more optimization, but you know, any, any more tips from uh, the example yeah. you just shared? 
Yeah, so I would say we can get into step two of the process. Um, so actually something that I wanted to to explain before that I kind of uh, forgot is like that the process that we follow with all the clients is something that we came up with because we noticed that uh, like the majority of all the clients we work with typically have three main big problems that they need to solve. So number one is they don't know which pages to build backlinks to, to be able to increase their signups, traffic and revenue faster. So this is what we try to solve with the content promotion roadmap, really nail down the uh, the direction, knowing which pages we're going to be dealing with. A problem number two that we saw a lot of companies have is they didn't really know what kind of backlinks and how many backlinks they needed to acquire to be able to rank those pages higher. Because uh, a lot of people, they, for example, might know okay uh, like we need mm, like 10 backlinks domain rating 50 plus just because maybe someone told them that 50 plus is a good domain rating metric you know for quality backlinks uh, so what they will do is they will just go to a link vendor or some kind of database and buy 10 links domain rating 50 plus the problem that we noticed is that <coughs> it's basically that it's not as simple right so all of uh, like you mentioned before, this is something that you want to have a look uh, specifically at the page level if you're trying to rank individual pages. So you really need to have a look at what's already ranking out there and and kind of assess the situation specifically for each keyword. So what we came up with is what we call the link analysis report. And uh, this is another three step framework that we always follow every quarter together with the roadmap. Once we have the target pages that we know we're going to be working on, and the target keywords. For each of them, we do this analysis, which is three steps. Number one, we want to identify the link gap. So how many backlinks and how fast we need uh, to build those backlinks to be able to rank the page higher. To, uh, to do that, uh, put in like simple terms, you can essentially have a look at the average of the referring domains that the top 10 ranking pages have. Uh, <coughs> calculate the difference between what you have now and those. So that gives you the basic link gap. Then the other important thing that you need to keep in mind is that all of those pages that are ranking in the top 10, uh, they're not static, right? They will keep acquiring backlinks every month. So you need to also uh, basically have a look at that. You really want to know how many new backlinks uh, uh, <coughs> those pages are acquiring every month. So you need to take those into account as well for the overall calculation. You then divide the total for these backlinks for how many months you want this campaign to be. Let's say you want to work at this for 12 months. So this can give you something like you need to build five or 10 backlinks every single month for 12 months to be able to close the gap for these specific keywords. So this number can be different for each keyword that you have <coughs> based on what you see essentially, right? Uh, once you know uh, how many backlinks you need, the second step is to have a look at the type of backlinks. So by type of backlinks, we typically mean uh, metric wise. So for us, the main metrics that we take into account is uh, domain level metrics, but also page level metrics. So domain rating, domain authority, uh, a URL rating, but also traffic to the domain and traffic to the page. Something that we've seen a lot recently is there's a lot of uh, link farms or sites that have been built with just the purpose of selling backlinks that have been able to really falsify their domain rating just by publishing a ton of content on like topics that are super easy to rank uh, to eventually acquire backlinks just to this informational content. What this does is it kind of inflates their domain rating. So you can see sites that have a domain rating of 70, 70, 80, but then you look into the site and it's essentially a giant collection of all sorts of topics under the sun. Maybe they have a, a menu bar with like beauty, business, fashion, you know, so it's not really relevant to anything. It's just targeting everything. <laughs> Uh, so that's what uh, that's what kind of helping them to rank higher and to get a higher domain rating. So you really want to be careful with those. And so the the easiest way to filter those sites out is to use page level metrics. So uh, so if you try to get backlinks from actual pages that have a high URL rating but also some traffic, that typically means that that specific page is ranking for keywords, which makes it a good resource. It means that it's liked by Google. And that has also the potential to bring in uh, referral traffic, which is also great, right? So if you get people coming straight to your site from a link, that's the best possible thing that you could uh, want from a backlink. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> have a question? Oh, I have a number of questions, but I don't want to interrupt you. Um, finish, finish your thought. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I do have some questions, okay. but they can wait. Okay, okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, you want to have a look at the type of backlinks in terms of metrics, a domain, as well as page level. Uh, then the next step is to determine uh, topical relevance. So topical relevance for us is two main things. You want to really have backlinks from pages that are about topics that are relevant to your topic, and you can gauge these from looking at the backlink profile of the other pages. Uh, so you can use a tool like Majestic SEO for this. They have topical trust flow. Um, so you can put in the top 10 ranking results, uh, see what is like the, the topical trust flow that is the most dominant between uh, <coughs> so across their backlink profile. So you can kind of mimic that and find pages that are covering same, uh, similar topics, essentially. The second uh, kind of aspect for topical relevance is the anchor text. So anchor text is quite a, of a difficult thing because in most situations you won't have control over it. Uh, so uh, so uh, this is unless you're doing guest post where you're actually creating the article. So in that case, you can control the anchor text. But if you're doing something different, like you're just doing maybe pitches to journalists or to websites, so in that case, you typically won't have control of the anchor text. Uh, but it's still good for us to have kind of like a distribution, uh, like an ideal distribution that is good for us to shoot for, right? So for example, we would see that to be able to rank for this keyword, uh, we need a 1% uh, kind of exact match. Maybe we need 10% phrase match, and then we need 5% URL and things like that, right? So once we know this distribution, it, this is good for us to have something that we can shoot for. And the other part of this is also uh, no follow versus do follow distribution. This is something else that's kind of like uh, debated uh, in the industry. I, I truly think that no follow links, uh, even though they don't have impact on like direct rankings. Uh, so I think they can still uh, bring in a trust signal that are very important uh, for a website uh, to have. So if you see that your competitors have a higher percentage of no follow backlinks, maybe you could try to build some of those as well. So this could be for a software company where we typically see, could be like directory links, you know? So yeah, it's definitely helpful to try and build up the trust of the site with some of these uh, <coughs> no follow backlinks in there. And that helps and that also helps to kind of dilute the backlink profile, especially if you're being a little bit aggressive with like building a lot of backlinks fast. It's also good to kind of complement with some no follow stuff. So yeah, this is it essentially step number two to recap uh, the link analysis. Uh, <clears throat> basically, number one, to identify the link gap. So how many links and how fast you need these backlinks. Number two, to identify the type of backlinks page level metrics and domain level metrics. And number three, to identify the topical relevance for those backlinks. Once you know all of these things, uh, you know the target pages that you have in the roadmap, then it's just a matter for actually getting out and do the work, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it could be a lot of work too, depending on what you come up with. Um, yeah. Let me get into some of the details here. I want to ask you some some in de some more detailed questions about some of this. So I'll just, I'll start at the top. You talked about step one in this link analysis is identifying link gap. So let's take a scenario um, that let's say we, we log in and we're sitting um, at spot four, spot five. Uh, we log in, I'm just going to give you a hypothetical. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. see that our competitors ahead of us have more links, but it's, it's in varying degrees, right? You look at maybe the number one competitor and maybe they have um, 10 backlinks, um, but they're only from three domains. Right, so I have I, I look mm -hmm. at them I'm like, oh my goodness, they have links from three domains, but on one of those they got like seven or eight backlinks, right? So uh, it shows up as ten backlinks, but three domain level links. And then the next person sitting number two, they have like links from one domain, but they have twenty five backlinks from that one domain, and it it can be a little hard to understand what type of links I need to build and which one of those metrics is important to pay attention mm -hmm. to. Do you look at like do follow backlinks that, and the gap as a domain level backlink? Like um, they have links from five domains, I have links from three domains, I need to make up that gap of a couple? Or is it more yeah, exactly. like the sheer number of backlinks? 
No, no, we only look at the unique referring domains that okay. are to follow typically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't look at the backlinks because, okay. as I'm sure you know, like uh, links from unique websites are more powerful than just the same website that keeps linking to you. Uh, so we try to keep it simple, at least in this uh, kind of step, and just look at the number of, of unique referring to follow domains, basically. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, good. That's some great clarity. You talked about what a link farm is, um, and uh, and you did a great job describing it. Uh, and I, I really I loved how you talked about kind of some of the ways to deep dive, whether it's a link farm that they, they, they you know they rank for a lot of random topics. Mm -hmm. The menu is really scattered. Any other tips on how to identify bad links or bad neighborhoods or other types of links to try to avoid? Yeah. So number one, I would say content quality. That tells you a lot. Uh, most of the times, if you see the content is really not very well written, it's not adding maybe anything unique to the topic. It's just like it looks very generic. Uh, you know, that's uh, typically very easy to spot uh, from someone. Um, uh, the second thing is I would say looking at the links that the content has. So if the content is already linking out to maybe 30 different websites and using exact match keywords, that's a, a very good indication that they are selling backlinks from that page. Uh, but the most important thing that I would say is just to look at this in more of a holistic way. So the question that I like to ask myself is uh, the site that I'm looking at, uh, what is their main business model? Like, do they have a product? Uh, do they have a service? Are they making money with something that seems legit? Because <clears throat> if the answer to this is not, then it typically just means that they're making money through selling backlinks, right? So if they don't have affiliate links, if they don't have a product to sell, or if they don't have a service that they do, then chances are they're just making money selling links. So that's typically the main thing for us, is making sure that the site is, is essentially operated by l like real people, if there's a company behind it, that's even better. If you can find LinkedIn profiles, see people on social media, that's always a, a very good sign. But you'll see that most of these link farms, they typically won't really have a, a clear person behind it. It just says, we are this and this blog, and we were born with the passion of explaining this niche, whatever it is, you know? Uh, so it will be very generic. There won't be a, a photos of real people. Uh, maybe they will have stock photos, which are pretty easy to spot as well. Um, so yeah, I definitely think this is the key factor here, making sure that it, the site is legitimate. So you're saying people actually have to leave their software tool of choice and go look at the website. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, in most situations. I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being sarcastic. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's funny how you have to say that, but you're exactly right. Like so many times we just look at data and we don't go to the actual website. And it's pretty easy sometimes to go, oh, well, this is yeah. not really a website that's you know trying to, uh, to do something with purpose here. Yeah, we definitely try to automate this, <laughs> but unfortunately it's, it's definitely very, it's very difficult and you always need to take the manual approach for a lot of these things. Yeah. Okay. I got more questions for you. I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to keep going down my yeah, list. Sure. I've, got a, I've got a page of questions. <laughs> um, lot is made about how, uh, or discussed a lot is discussed about how relevant does that, uh, URL you're getting a link from need to be. And then we get into like, and, and uh, I, I get asked this question personally a lot, so I can only imagine mm -hmm. how much you have to noodle over it. Like, um, obviously the best link would be from a very strong authoritative uh, domain in my industry. But if, I, if I'm working with links and how, how relevant do they need to be if I can't get the perfect link there? Is it maybe, it's um, a, a website that's a little more broad, but they're talking on that page about something that has to do with mm -hmm. my niche? Or is it the, the entire URL needs to be about something that has to do with my niche? Like how, in, how relevant do I need to make these backlinks as it relates to what I do in my website's strength? Yeah, so that's a very good point. Uh, it all comes down from step two. So from the analysis that we do, we can kind of get a feel for the topical relevance that we need to kind of shoot for. So at that point, we will be able to know we need 10 super relevant backlinks from pages that are talking about the topics, from websites that are talking about the topics, or maybe chances are we just need links from pages that are, that are talking about the topic, but maybe the, the whole domain is more generic. 
So really we need to base the decision on the data that we have. This is something that I really kind of try to emphasize every time. Uh, like, like everything in SEO is kind of like a guessing game. We're like at the end of the day, we're trying to game the algorithm in one way <coughs> like or the other. So the only thing that we have is the data as, and what we see uh, ranking out there. So I really believe in making decision based on this data. And, uh, but yeah, like you said, uh, generally speaking, if I were to uh, give advice, uh, typically the best backlinks is from a relevant page that's on a relevant website uh, domain. So you want both page relevancy, but also domain relevancy. If you can get both, page relevancy I think is more important than domain relevancy because you're getting the backlinks from that page and from the context of the article. So that's important for Google to understand what the link is about. Um, so yeah, we'll say try to prioritize both as the main thing. If you can't get both, prioritize the page level uh, relevancy. You mentioned the importance of uh, nofollow links. Um, how does somebody analyze, how do you recommend somebody analyzes how many nofollow links they need? Um, typically we talk about it in terms of a percentage, right? So like mm -hmm. uh, a percentage of your backlink profile should be uh, nofollow. Like how do you analyze that? And then also what are some, you mentioned directories, but what, like what are some good places for people who go, oh man, I'm not, I don't have enough nofollow links. Like what are some good ways for people to go out and get nofollow links and build those? Yeah, so for us, no follow links, this is something that we don't necessarily do for our clients ourselves, but we might make recommendations for them to go after these types of links. So this could be, as I said, directories, social media links, uh, this could be forums or things like Reddit, for example, or like Quora, you know, so all things. The main key point is that even if you go after no follow links, try to make them as relevant as possible. So if you want to no follow links, maybe find a good relevant questions on Quora or a good relevant post on Reddit and try to place your link in there to kind of open up the discussion and actually get people to click on that link. Uh, the more the nofollow link gets interacted with and the more natural it looks within that conversation, the more um, like effective it's going to be to build that trust that I was talking about before. So it's just a matter, as I said, of uh, the way that I like to see this is try to build bridges between pages across the web. That's the whole kind of view that I have about the link building process, but especially no follow links. If you're not going after the SEO juice, try to at least make them useful and relevant for people to actually use, you know. You you mentioned anchor text, and I think that for most people, they understand that anchor text is important in link building, and they know that um, you can get it wrong <laughs> and make mistakes there, but you really talked uh, in your example, like 1% exact, you know, 10% partial and phrase match, and these kind mm -hmm. of words, like how do people maybe do a better job with their anchor text and understanding um, maybe how to improve their anchor text and their analysis of it? Uh, yeah, so I would say the easiest approach that you can do, and unfortunately this will involve some manual things that you have to do again, uh, is, you can, so is you can essentially export the backlinks that the top 10 ranker results have for your target keywords if you're doing this at the page level. Uh, so then what you can do is simply classify this anchor text in the four main buckets. For us, the main anchor text buckets are uh, so exact match, which is the actual keyword that you want to rank for. And then we have partial, which is a keyword that's containing some of the words from the exact match. Then we use a URL. This is a simple naked URL. And then we use generic for everything else. So anything like click here, see this link, or uh, the brand name, uh, for example, these are, we classify them in, in the generic anchor text. So once you have all the backlinks for the top 10 ranking pages, you can manually go in and classify these links for each of the four buckets. And then you will come up with distribution for each of the top 10 ranking pages. So you simply calculate the average for each of the four buckets. So that gives you uh, the distribution that you should ideally shoot for, right? So as I said, this is not exact science and it's very difficult most of the times to control the anchor text of the backlinks that you acquire. So unless you're doing guest posting. Uh, so this for us is useful to be able, for example, uh, like in those situations where we've built maybe 10 backlinks to a page and we know that it needed 10 backlinks, 
but for some reason the page is still stuck there, then in that situation we know that we might want to have a look at the anchor text situation because maybe we haven't been aggressive enough or maybe we've been too aggressive, you know? So in that situation that helps as like a further kind of uh, qualification that we can do to the backlink profile to be more uh, strategic, essentially to move the needle. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. That, that helps. That helps. Um, kind of final question as we start to move towards wrap it up, at least final question for me on this, on this topic, speed, velocity, the velocity at which you build links and um, does it have importance uh, to have a certain velocity? Can you go too fast? Uh, are there certain speeds that you should be cautious of if you're a newer website versus a more aged website? Like, let's talk about the velocity that, that you build links at. Yeah, so I think, uh, yes, speed, speed matters. Uh, that said, it really depends on the website that you have. As you said, if it's uh, like an older website, then you can probably take on a higher speed of links. Um, so I would say for more competitive keywords and terms, that's typically when you really want to have a look at the velocity because chances are you already have a ton of links for those pages that you want to rank for. The competition will already have a lot of links. So in those situations, speed is probably more important than the sheer quantity, uh, quantity and quality as well. Quality will be more important probably if you're a newer site that needs to establish relevance and kind of authority there in the space. Uh, so in the beginning, if you're a newer site, I would recommend to focus more on link quality than on quantity and speed, right? To establish that initial kind of relevancy. But then over time, as you start to build authority and you start to compete uh, against uh, more difficult websites and pages, you will probably have to mo move more towards a higher speed together with quality and quantity as well. Got it. Good. Yeah, I, that's, that's a tough one, right? Like build, building links is hard enough as it is when you then have to factor mm -hmm. in how fast you need to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Adds a whole other yeah, level of complexity true. to it. Uh, something else that you mentioned is also um, like, is there such a thing as uh, too fast or too many links? I think uh, not. Uh, so if the links are good quality, because if you think about some of those digital PR examples, right, there's a page maybe that goes viral, that page starts acquiring hundreds of thousands of links in one day maybe, and that like doesn't seem to harm the page. That's because the links are super high quality, super relevant. So I think uh, speed doesn't harm, uh, but you really need to make sure that it's good quality links. Like if you start bombarding a page with like uh, PBN links, that's of course not gonna be a good thing. That's where the velocity has a different uh, plays a different role, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't talk much about how to build links today, and um, you know, so I, I not because you don't have a ton of value to share there. Um, I just think that your analysis and your strategic insights of how to build a plan were just so valuable that I really wanted to deep dive those. So. Um, but I just wanted to highlight, like, even though we didn't talk mm -hmm. about the process of how to build links, um, I know that was uh, that was something that you can add a lot of value to. Talk a little about a little bit about your agency um, and specifically, like, what you guys do for clients, because this level of depth in terms of strategic link building, I'll say, is probably pretty in depth for most people that are listening or maybe have worked with another link building agency in the past. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we specialize in working with B2B SaaS companies for the most part. The reason for this is because by focusing on this specific niche, we were able to identify those patterns, those key pages that we know SaaS companies typically have. And so we also know how to go about doing the link prospecting, for example, to be able to get backlinks to a specific type of pages like uh, feature pages or alternative to pages. We know by now how to go about doing the prospecting for those pages. Things like finding links to listicles, so list articles that uh, things like the best 10 software for cold email, for example. We have all of those uh, kind of um, campaign types nailed down by now. That said, we also work with different types of client as long as I said that the content is good quality, the content is, is targeting keywords with search traffic potential, typically across all the three stages of the funnel. 
so we've been working with affiliate website as long as the content is really good information and good quality. We've been working with some e-commerce website, even though those are, I would say, the minority. And so, yeah, that's the thing. We can work essentially with anyone that's building a lot of content, that's publishing a lot of content, but doesn't have the time or the resources to go about uh, promoting that content and making it rank higher, essentially. People that are stuck in the content graveyard, basically. I think I do like your names for these things. <laughs> um, <laughs> It does feel like it. That's where content goes to die. Um, and then how can people follow along with what you're doing or connect with you? Can you give us some, uh, whether it's uh, a link or Twitter or wherever's best? Uh, yeah, so people can get in touch with me directly on Twitter. I'm quite active in there. At, at my handle, it is Alan G. Gorilla. Or you can find us on our website, which is mygrowthgorilla.com. And we recently launched our like our own podcast, which is called uh, Promote or Die, which makes sense for the content graduate as well. And it's all about content promotion, digital PR, link building, all these things. And then we also launched our online course. So if you go on our website, uh, you can find the page for the course. It's called uh, Double Your Traffic in 90 Days. And this goes over the entire process that we just talked about here. So you can find the three steps. Uh, so the roadmap process, the link analysis process, and the campaign process with spreadsheets and kind of everything that we sort of use uh, for our clients, essentially. Well, it's been great. I mean, you referenced like that whole third step we didn't really even get into today on the podcast because we spent mm -hmm. so much time on first and second steps. So <laughs> that's a good reason for people to go check that out at the very least. Um, I'll include uh, links to this in the show notes too as well. Um, Alan, this was fantastic. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate all your insights and uh, we'll have to circle back and catch up with you again soon. Yeah, thank you, Jared. It's been great and I'm definitely happy to come back for part two. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. What a masterpiece PR link building campaign with 20 links in big publications such as The Sun, Express, Mirror, Wales Online and Still Landing I would say this campaign is a massive success. We told the press that people should turn on their heating this summer if they want to save money next winter. And we landed over 20 links in national and regional UK publications for our boiler client. That's crazy. The campaign hook was pretty clever. It is a known fact, at least in the boiler trade, that if you keep your boiler off for many months, it might rust and it might get you into trouble if you keep it turned off from spring to next winter. We therefore advise the press with an expert commentary piece on behalf of our boiler client that people should turn on their boiler this summer just when the heat wave is in full swing. This way they can avoid a boiler failure next winter and save money. Massive publications picked up our story, including The Sun, Express, Mirror, Wales Online, and a few more dozen publications, giving our client links, lots of links, and lots of happiness hormones. No wonder that so many journalists covered our story as this headline is a massive link magnet to their audience. This case study highlights the fact that a clever hook can be applied to any insight or story to make a campaign more successful and more compelling to journalists. Can you imagine when people see this headline in the news, you should turn on your boiler this summer. There is no way they would not click on it. I would click on it. So this was the hook and this is why this campaign was so successful. I hope this video inspires and shows you what's possible with a clever hook. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now.